We're going to start with the topic that is probably the most... Oh, look, the laptops have appeared. It's amazing. Make sure you go to the site. No, really. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start with arrhythmias. And we're going to try and make them easy for you. And I say easy, but actually probably should be easier. Arrhythmias are tricky. But after today, you'll know all of this and all of this. Because when you first look at that, what's going on? OK, let's talk about the absolute basics. What is an arrhythmia? Arrhythmia just basically means abnormal heart rate or rhythm. That's essentially what it means. And to the patient, it's highly variable what can happen and what they can feel. Most people with arrhythmias don't realize they're having them at all. They're totally asymptomatic. Some patients with arrhythmias get palpitations, the sort of sensation of their heartbeat, and we'll describe that to you. And then another group of patients have the opposite end of the spectrum and present in severe decompensated cardiac disease. So they might present with severe uh, ischemic heart disease type changes um, and present with chest pain. If they've got heart failure, they may present with pulmonary edema, shortness of breath, etc. They can present with syncope. So they fall over, they lose consciousness because the heart is so irregular, it can't pump blood up to the brain properly. And they can even present in sudden death. One of the major causes of sudden death in young people of our kind of age. I'm running out of time that I can include myself in, in that group. But one of the major causes of sudden death is a arrhythmia. So when do we treat it? When do we treat an arrhythmia? Now, this is the first rule of arrhythmias that I want you to try and remember. We always treat if the rhythm is dangerous. And what I mean by that is that rhythm has got the propensity to deteriorate. So there are certain rhythms, which I'm going to tell you about today, that we don't like. We see that rhythm and we go, no, we, need to, we have to treat that. Because if we don't, it could get worse. And then the other reason that we treat is because of decompensation. It's because we're, get, we're being presented with one of those patients who is highly symptomatic from having an abnormal heart rate or rhythm. And these are the four cardinal features of symptomatology with rhythm, um, arrhythmias. So, and they all completely make sense. Low blood pressure. So if the heart is not um, beating correctly, that might affect the cardiac output and cause a low blood pressure. Makes sense. Reduce consciousness. If it's not pumping enough blood to the brain, makes sense. Abnormal heart rhythm, not pumping the blood. Chest pain. That's a little bit more in depth, but think of it like this. If someone's got their arteries clogged, they've got a history of ischemic heart disease, they're going to be much less able to cope with any change. Their homeostatic mechanisms with the arrival of arrhythmia are going to be much less at keeping a steady state. So they're going to be symptomatic. And of course, they'll get chest pain. And it's the same with heart failure. So patients with heart failure who have a propensity to get pulmonary edema may present with um, pulmonary edema in association with an arrhythmia. So now this makes a little bit more sense. Okay, Up here, we've got assess using the ABCDE approach. You, you always do that, as Stephen said. That's a given. Don't worry about that. And then adverse features, shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia, heart failure. Okay, So you already know that bit. We've done that. You see? There. OK. So now we've got the basics over. We need to talk about the two big groups, tachycardias and bradycardias, how they work. So let's start with brady. In terms of rates, you've probably heard lots of different people tell you different rates for a bradycardia. Just remember 60. Okay, there are lots. There are probably people in, in this room right now sitting with a heart rate greater or less. Sorry, less than 60. You are perfectly healthy, but generally 60. Okay, bradycardia is caused by essentially two types of problem with the impulses in the heart. Either they're not being generated properly, usually because of a problem with the sinoatrial node, or once they are generated, they're not conducted properly around the conduction system of the heart. Let's start with this one first. If it's the main problem with 
bad generation is a condition called sick sinus syndrome. Okay? And this is all you'll ever need to know about sick sinus syndrome until you're sitting your MRCP. Basically, it happens in elderly patients, and that kind of goes along with the pathophysiology. Basically, as you get older, one of the main changes in the heart is fibrosis. And you can get fibrosis of the sinoatrial node, which is, of course, the impulse generator of the heart, and the tissue surrounding that, which is responsible for transmitting that around the atria. And that leads to sort of intermittent failure of impulse generation and propagation. Okay? So these patients get sort of intermittent arrhythmias, intermittent periods where they have ectopic beats because th there's been no sinoatrial stimulation. So the ventricle gives out a kick, a kick and they get an ectopic. They get sort of what this thing called tachybrady symptoms, where sometimes their heart rate's going fast and then it's going very slow. Um, and they're often treated with pacemakers, this group, if they're very symptomatic. Okay. So that's sick sinus syndrome. This is the one you're probably much more familiar with. These, this is heart block. These, this group of features, these different types, are what we call heart block. And this is where the, the problem is not with the generation of the impulse, but with how it's being propagated. And there are three degrees of heart block. You've got first degree heart block, second degree heart block, and third degree, which is also known as complete heart block. First degree heart block is basically where your PR interval is prolonged, okay? So greater than 0.2. And it has very sort of little clinical significance. There are some cases, more advanced cases, where it may have significance, but there may even be a couple of you sitting in this room right now who have first degree heart block and it doesn't cause you any worry whatsoever. We then come on to second degree heart block, which we can subdivide into Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. And basically, what you see in this group of conditions are missed beats. So you see, um, it does not shown particularly well here, but you see a, a P there and then a very long interval, and so much more than the 0.2 here. And there, so it's a missed beat and then a QRS complex. And then in second degree, you've got a gradual lengthening of the interval followed by a misbeat. So gradual lengthening of the PR interval followed by a misbeat, and that's called the Venkerbach phenomenon. And then in third degree heart block, this is the one you really, really, really mustn't miss because this needs treatment. Third degree heart block is one of those conditions. Remember I said, when do you treat? Third degree heart block is one of those conditions that even if the patient is sitting there completely well with none of those adverse signs of decompensation, chest pain, syncope, um, symptoms, they need to be treated. And we'll talk about what that is. And basically what you've got here is a complete dissociation between the P waves, so representing the atria, and the ventricles. So it's all over the place. You've got a P, then a QRS, and then another QRS, and a PP, Q, right? so they're completely disorganized from each other. And as you can see, down the left-hand side, we've got shown here severity. So as you go down here, things become more severe. These two are relatively OK. You see these, not worry. These two, Mobitz type 2, third degree heart block, you need to do something about it. Dangerous rhythms need to be treated. Oh, I could have zoomed in. OK, so treatment of bradycardias. Now, this is where we come to the rule number two of arrhythmias. And it's pretty obvious. If it's slow, speed it up. OK? And how do you speed it up? Heart block is relatively, or bradycardia is relatively easy. You give atropine, not adenosine, atropine. So atropine is the drug, the one drug I want you to remember today for bradycardias. Okay? Atropine will increase your heart rate, and you can give it multiple times. If that doesn't work, or if the patient is really, really sick, then they're not, going, they're not be, going, going to be able to pace their heart correctly with these conditions, things like complete heart block. And not, atropine's not going to really work in that situation because the, the atropine sort of relies a little bit upon there being somewhat of a normal conduction system. If the conduction system is buggered up, you need to actually pace the heart for your patient. And you can do that in two ways. 
you can temporarily pace them, and that goes from literally having your patient there doing that on their chest. That will pace most people. Through to having pads, which you may have seen used for defibrillation. You can use, those, you can use pads applied to the patient's chest with electricity to pace their heart. You can also put in a central line and put a wire right down into the atria and pace the heart that way. And then finally, and I'm sure you've all seen this, you can put in a pacemaker, which is a permanent pacing device. And we got a male conflict. That's very good. OK. So let's go back to the thing that looked scary. Still looks a little bit scary. You probably can't see it too well, but I want to just review the principles. So patient comes in, patient-centered approach. You always resuscitate the patient. That's very important. If they don't need to be resuscitated, you then think about, oh, they've got an arrhythmia. You know that. Do they have any adverse signs? Those are shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia, and heart failure. If so, that remember I said what needs to be treated? That needs to be treated. Okay? So you use one of your drugs, which is atropine. Okay? Atropine is a drug for bradycardia. Does it work? No. You can give it a few more times. Um, if the patient is really unwell, as you can see down here, or has a condition that is really dangerous, like Mobitz type 2, complete heart block, where if they're very symptomatic, not responding to any atropine, then of course you would have got specialist help by then. But the kind of techniques that you would be thinking of using are things like pacing. So whatever that may be, temporary or permanent. Okay. That's pretty much all you need to know about bradycardias. Unfortunately, tachycardias aren't so easy. So, just like bradycardia, as we said, bradycardia is less than 60. A tachycardia is greater than 100. The first thing you need to ask yourself is, when you see, when you see a tachycardia, you're given an ECG, you calculate the rate. Like good students, you go straight for the rate after the name, of course, date of birth, etc. This is an ECG, blah, blah, blah. You calculate the rate, and you see it's greater than 100. Aha, I have a tachycardia. You need to decide, where is the problem? First of all, say, is this a problem of above the ventricles, or supraventricular? Is this a supraventricular tachycardia? Or is it a ventricular tachycardia? Is the problem coming from the ventricles themselves? And the way you decide that is very simple. You look at the QRS complex. If it's less than 0.12, so if it's nice and narrow, just like this, which is obviously fast, about 150. And it's, as you see, these QRS complexes are narrow. Okay? So that is most likely to be a supraventricular tachycardia. If the QRS complexes are very wide, then that is much more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia. So greater than 0.12 is ventricular. So there's one for comparison. It doesn't project as well, but hopefully you can see that it's fast. And these are the QRS complexes, and they are wide, definitely wider than three squares. The clever people in here will have already realized a problem with this classification system that I've given you. And that's that life isn't always so easy, unfortunately. Often, um, multiple things go wrong at once in the heart. And there's something called bundle branch block, which messes up my classification system very unkindly. So you can, in bundle branch block, you can have a problem that's up here. So you could have a problem with the sinoatrial node, a problem with the AV node, and you'd be expecting the heart to be fast and the complexes to be narrow. But because of another problem further downstream, a problem with the conduction system called a bundle branch block in one of these bundles here, that the impulses aren't being passed down to the ventricles properly. So the ventricles aren't able to give that narrow complex response. So what they do is they go wide. So if you have an SVT with a bundle branch block, you won't get 
narrow, complex tachycardia. You'll get broad, complex tachycardia. Now, the next thing you're expecting me to say is, how can you tell the difference? Now, that is very, very difficult. Um, there are a few techniques, but it would probably take another half an hour to explain what they are, and I actually don't really know what they are, so I'm not going to do that. Stephen probably could, but not me. Um, basically, you just need to know, if you see a narrow complex tachycardia, uh, sorry, broad complex tachycardia, it could be one of two things. It could be a, a ventricular tachycardia, or it could be a supraventricular tachycardia with a bundle branch block. And hopefully you would have come across this, which is a hopeless slide, which was uh, missed off our proofreading session last night. Um, if you'll see that you can recognize right bundle branch blocks um, by looking at the pattern, the RSR1 patterns in both V1 and V6. In V1, you get this M-type figure in right bundle branch block. And in left bundle branch block, you get the M in V6, and that should be an M, which is why it's a hopeless slide, and really all doesn't make sense anyway. Is that your slide? No, 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 no. Yeah, good. OK, so base, that's the basic classification system. Let's talk a little bit more now about actually what rhythms are there and why they're, import, well, you know, why they're important. So this I've already told you. Broad QRS greater than 0.12. It's either ventricular or it's supraventricular with one of those bundle branch blocks. There are, I'm going to leave this one off, <coughs> torsades, but the major ventricular Arrhythmias are ventricular tachycardia, appropriate, and ventricular fibrillation. This is ventricular fibrillation. Okay. If you see this pattern, the first thing, you, the next thing you should do is look at your patient because they're dead. Okay. They do not have a cardiac output, and they need to be resuscitated. Okay. It can be difficult to recognise this. I have been in a situation where I have been talking to a patient who has been in ventricular fibrillation. It can be difficult. I should have realized that they were dead, but anyway. Ventricular fibrillation looks like a child squiggle. That's the best way to describe it and the best way to remember it. If it just looks all over the place and the patient is, you know, on the bed, alarm bells, this needs to be, this patient needs to be resuscitated. This, on the other hand, is ventricular tachycardia. Now, this doesn't look so all over the place. It looks fast, I agree, and it's got wide QRS complexes, which makes it a ventricular tachycardia. Unfortunately, this can also be associated with the patient being dead as well. Um, you can get ventricular tachycardia, um, what's called pulseless VT. So you can get ventricular tachycardia where there's no cardiac output at all. But on the other hand, it can be very well tolerated. The patient can be talking to you and have this at the same time. So it's important just to be aware that ventricular rhythms, and this is the sort of rule you should have, are serious. And they can be associated with the patient being dead, but VT sometimes isn't. That's in quite stark contrast to the supraventricular rhythms, which are quite common and um, not as dangerous. Now, when we... We've already spoken about one system, so wide and narrow QRS complexes. If you see a narrow QRS complex and you think it's supraventricular, the next question you ask yourself is, are those QRS complexes irregular on the ECG, or are they regular? If they're irregular, then you most likely have atrial fibrillation. You're dealing with atrial fibrillation. If they're regular in a really strict pattern, you can see very clear P waves, they're very regular, then you're dealing with probably one of three things. A sinus tachycardia, which I should probably just say is the most common reason for, be, for a patient being tachycardic. AVNRT, which I'll explain in a minute, and AVRT. AVNRT stands for AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. AVRT is just atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, or AV reentrant tachycardia. So let's start by talking about the regular ones. So these are the ones that are not atrial fibrillation. 
The most common is sinus tachycardia. And you all have experienced this before exams, before first dates, all that kind of thing. It's an appropriate response. The rate is coming from the heart. Your heart is going fast for a reason, usually because of pain, exercise, anxiety. Okay? Those are the good reasons. However, it can also happen in serious stuff as well, particularly hypovolemia. So one of the responses of there being, a, being less blood in the, in the body is for the heart to try and pump faster to get more oxygen to the tissues. So it's an appropriate response to hypovolemia. Pulmonary embolism is a very important cause of sinus tachycardia, thyrotoxicosis, and the use of anything that has a sympathomimetic action. So anything with adrenaline-like properties obviously will make your heart go faster. So that's the easy one. These two are the other two you need to know about. So AV, nodal reentrant tachycardia. So what's all this about? Well, first of all, remember, it's an SVT. So the problem is in above this, uh, this line drawn here. It's not in the ventricles. It's not in the sinoatrial node. It's actually in the AV node. Okay? And what's happening is there is a local pathway that's been formed for many reasons, but let's keep it simple. And for some reason, it's going round and round and round. So the AV node is it's being reactivated and reactivated again and again and again. It's just going round. It's re-entrance tachycardia. And that response, because it's, kept, keep, it's being activated again and again and again, that's going down to the ventricles, and they're going very, very fast. Bang, 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 bang. In AVRT, on the other hand, the problem is not at the node itself. The problem is in the pathway between the atria and the ventricles. There is an accessory pathway present which allows direct communication between the atria and the ventricles. And there is, in the tachycardia situation, there's a setting up of a sort of localized reentrant type circuit there, which does exactly the same thing. <coughs> because this is very low resistance, it just allows impulses to go straight through AV node and back round again and again and again, and that causes a tachycardia. The most common thing that you'll come across in that group where there's that accessory bundle is this condition called Wolf-Parkinson-White, WPW. It's the most common AV reentrant tachycardia. And the reason is this accessory pathway, just like I showed you on this diagram here. There's an accessory pathway with this thing called the bundle of Kent. And the two features you need to know about on an ECG are a very short PR interval and something called a delta wave which is basically where the QRS complex, instead of going down, up, like that, it just goes like that, like a Greek delta. I haven't got an ECG of it, unfortunately. OK, so that's all of the regular SVTs. What about the treatment of those? Well, now this becomes a rule three. If it's fast, slow it down. And before, remember, when we talked about bradycardias, our options were atropine, not adenosine, atropine, and pacing, either permanent or um, temporary. In tachycardia, we've got quite a few more options. So we can do conservative things. And this is often what we try first. The situation I've seen is a young person comes in, kind of our age, they've got a pulse of 150, 160. They're fine with that. They can cope. They're young. They're otherwise fit and healthy. They have an ECG. It shows. It confirms they've got a regular pulse of 150. The ECG is narrow complex, so it's a supraventricular tachycardia, and it's regular. Okay. We don't think it's sinus because we can't see any P waves. So we decide, aha, this is AVNRT or AVRT. We need to stop this for the patient because it's not very nice. So the first thing we try is we do conservative stuff. We don't like to give drugs if we can avoid it or give the patient a big shock. So we try simple stuff. Valsalva maneuvers. Stuff like blowing all the way out into a paper bag, for example. Stuff like pressing on the eye, pressing on the carotid sinus. All of these things can terminate a tachycardia. 
by providing increased parasympathetic drive to the heart, essentially, is how they work. If that doesn't work, we then move on to our next weapon, which is probably the best one, and which tends to work most of the time, and that's this drug called adenosine. Adenosine basically just kickstarts the heart out of its rhythm, stops it for a little bit, and then puts it straight back into normal rhythm. It's very, very unpleasant for the patient, though. If you are standing in A&E and you're on your A&E attachment and there's a patient there being given adenosine, hold their hand, even if you're a boy. Hold their hand. It's a very horrible experience. Amiodarone is another drug that we often use um, to manage not so much acute, but sort of the chronic management of these conditions. And then finally, electricity. If the patient is very unwell with their tachycardia, so they've got all, any of those features of instability, low blood pressure, loss of consciousness, heart failure, chest pain, then it may be that they need urgent treatment, that we haven't got time to be faffing around pressing on their neck and pressing on their eyes and explaining why we're doing it and holding their hands and all that stuff. We need to shock them. And that's the one case where you actually you shock them out of their rhythm. And that can be very, very effective. OK. So now let's talk about irregular SVTs. And we're nearly at the end, you'll be pleased to hear of me as. Atrial fibrillation. So this is atrial fibrillation. You know it's atrial fibrillation because you look at the ECG. It's fast, so it's a tachycardia. QRS complexes are narrow, less than three squares, or 0.12. So it's supraventricular. And it's irregular. Now, often it can be really difficult. And some of you are probably looking at that and thinking, yeah, it's not irregular. It looks pretty regular to me. It can be really difficult to tell if this is regular or irregular, especially with fast AF. Okay. What it can be helpful to do is get a piece of paper. I don't think I can do it, but hold it up put a line down each side between two, and then just compare it along. And then you'll actually be able to see whether that's um, regular or regular or not. If anyone wants to ask me about that, and that was a crap demonstration, do come and ask. Um, and of course, there'll be absent P waves as well, because there's no, the sinoatrial node is not giving its standard beating P wave. It's absent. But it's difficult, because with fast AF, some of you might easily be forgiven for saying, for example, oh, that's a P wave. Uh, that's a P wave. That's a P wave. It's difficult because the T wave and the P wave sort of merge together when it's very fast. Or they seem to, I should say. So I don't want to talk for a long time about atrial fibrillation, but I want to give you the sort of overriding principle that will make your knowledge of atrial fibrillation. And it is certainly one of the more common things that you will see and more one of the more common things in exams, because, for the, well, for that exact reason, because you have to see it in hospital. You've got two options. You can have rate control in atrial fibrillation, or, he says, you can have rhythm control in atrial fibrillation. In rate control, what we do is we say, OK, patient's got atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation in itself isn't too bad, okay, as long as it's not going too fast and they're not massively compromised. Um, we don't want to give them nasty drugs or shocks to get them out of atrial fibrillation, we'll just let it go. We'll let them stay in atrial fibrillation. Okay. But there are two caveats to that. One is that we need to protect them from getting a very fast rate, ventricular rate, from their atrial fibrillation. We don't want them going at 150. We want them sort of 70 or 80, maybe. And to do that, we give a drug that slows the rate of the heart. And the two most commonly used drugs are beta blockers. Okay, they work very, very well, just at slowing the ventricular response. And in, particularly in the case of heart failure, and this is a link I want you to make right now, heart failure and AF equals digoxin. Okay, rule for you. So we slow the heart rate down. And then we say, well, the other issue is, in atrial fibrillation, is because the atria is very disorganized, the chance of a thrombus forming within the atria is much greater. And if a thrombus forms within the atria, um, 
lots of things can happen. Most often it forms in the left atria. So unfortunately, you get a big clot that goes down to the left ventricle, gets pumped up, and then causes a stroke. Okay? And we want to try and pr prevent that happening. And if you don't give a patient anticoagulation, they have a 4% risk of getting a stroke. If you do, it's down to 1%. Okay? Anticoagulation is not always warfarin. I think that's useful to say. Warfarin is the thing that people sort of traditionally associate with anticoagul anticoagulation in AF. What we know now, though, actually, is that if you're relatively low risk for developing a stroke anyway, you can actually just give aspirin instead of warfarin. Okay? There are some nice guidelines that you can read if you're really interested. Uh, but just remember that anticoagulation is usually warfarin, but not always. In, say, a young man who came in, no other cardiac risk factors, episode of atrial fibrillation, uh, in the long term, that person, if they stayed in atrial fibrillation, may not get warfarin, they may just get aspirin. The next approach is using rhythm. So saying, we're not happy with the patient to be in atrial fibrillation. We want to get them out of it. How do we get them out of atrial fibrillation? We use either drugs or electricity. Let me give you some common examples. Um, I'll give you another case. Uh, one of the big causes of atrial fibrillation is alcohol. Um, I was doing A&E this time last year. We had a student from Imperial come in who had been on a bender. Um, I think it was a rag, rag dash or something. He came in. He was in atrial fibrillation. Drunk, not looking very happy. We gave him flecainide. We tried other things first, for his sinus maneuver, all that sort of rubbish. Didn't work. We gave him flecainide, went away, and he was left with his hangover. So, flecainide is one drug you can use. It's the drug that you would use in someone with a healthy heart, though. Okay? So you only use those, uh, that type of drug if someone has got no history of cardiac disease. If they do have a history of cardiac disease, so if it's a more elderly patient with atrial fibrillation, um, you want to gain some rhythm control, then you have to think about using something like amiodarone, um, which is a very effective drug, um, but is a bit more, the side effects are more numerous. The other option, of course, is DC cardioversion, for atrial fibrillation. Um, this is most often done, it's, it's actually some of done acutely if the patient's really unwell. It's another reason for shocking the patient if they're very, very unwell, they're decompensated. But most often it's done as a sort of outpatient procedure. So the patient will have atrial fibrillation, um, rhythm managed um, control will be decided upon, they'll then be anticoagulated for a period, they may have an echo to make sure they don't have a clot sitting in their atrium. Um, and then they'll be given a little anaesthetic, put them to sleep, shock them out of atrial fibrillation, wake up, and they're free of it. Sometimes they get it back. Sometimes they have to be on a drug afterwards. But DC cardioversion can be used. And then often after that, as I said, they're given drugs to help maintain sinus rhythm. Right. So now, this should all make sense. Should. Should make sense. So your patient comes in. ABC, resuscitate the patient, patient-centered approach. Do they have any adverse features? The four adverse features, shock, syncope, myocardial infarction, heart failure. If they do, shit, this patient needs urgent treatment. And they're going to need to be shocked, pretty much. I would check, you know, you check with the senior first, but they need to be sh pretty, they're pretty much going to need to be shocked. If they are not like that, you've got time to play with. They're OK. Give them some oxygen, monitoring, venous access that move mnemonic that Stephen spoke about earlier. Then you go down your pathway. You decide, is the QRS narrow? Narrow. Is it broad? Broad. If it's broad, it could be an SVT with a bundle branch block, or it could be one of the nasty ventricular tachycardias. So check if the patient's alive. Hopefully, you would have picked that up at the top. If it's narrow, you decide, is it regular? Is it irregular? If it's ir irregular, it's AF, and you start thinking about either cardioverting the patient, so controlling their rhythm, their, their rhythm, or you think about controlling their rate. So if it's very, very fast, you think about maybe, oh, maybe I'll give them a beta blocker, slow things down a bit. If it's a regular SVT, then you're probably dealing with, well, it could be sinus tachycardia, so rule out all the causes of sinus tachycardia. That's most common. 
or you could be dealing with an AV NRT or an AV RT. And then you need to think about conservative things, vagal maneuvers, ocular pressure, carotid pressure. And you can think about using this drug, this nasty hand-holding drug, adenosine, which will reset the heart. All you need to know about arrhythmias. Stephen, it's your go.